I found that I can't stop talking about the Rise of Jordan Peterson documentary, like relating things from the documentary to my ongoing 12 Rules for Life analysis series. And since my subscribers don't seem too keen on checking it out, may as well go through it here. Plus, there's not too many reviews up on YouTube for this documentary, so may as well add my opinion from someone on the dreaded left. This video made possible thanks to the continuing support of viewers, patrons, and PayPal pals like you. Thanks! Hi! Welcome back to the channel! If you're new here, hi, I'm Cass. I have a cognitive psychology PhD and have been going through Jordan B. Peterson's 12 Rules for Life and Antidote to Chaos, and mostly trying to look at the science he's bringing to the party, but also analyzing just the logic and arguments. And just to be totally clear, cognitive psychology is one of the experimental branches of psychology and is completely different from counseling psychology, which is what Peterson's PhD is in. So we're both psychologists, but different branches of psychology. This is going to be a weird synergistic video for this channel. On the one hand, I'm talking about Peterson, which is pretty on brand for me at this point. On the other, I'm reviewing a documentary, which is something I haven't done on here yet. So this should be an interesting but familiar change of pace. Let's start with some general comments about the documentary itself. First, and perhaps most importantly, this documentary was more balanced than I was expecting, especially after watching the trailer. It's definitely focused on Peterson, which makes sense, but critics are given screen time to explain their side. And I think the filmmakers tried to be neutral in following and portraying Peterson, but as a not-Peterson fan, it can feel indulgent or biased at places. Second, this wasn't brought up in the documentary itself, but it was originally supposed to be about Peterson's naming ceremony by a member of one of Canada's First Nation groups. And if you think I slaughter Russian or German last names, I'm not even going to try with this one. Nope. So the name of the tribe is on screen now. If you aren't familiar, this naming ceremony was a show of honor and respect by one of Peterson's friends, a guy by the name of Charles Joseph. And in the Pursue What is Meaningful, Not What is Expedient chapter, Joseph was brought up as the guy who had gone through Canada's residential schools. The people behind the documentary, specifically Patricia Markocha, got interested in Peterson when she read Maps of Meaning as an undergrad. A little bit of time passes, and eventually she approaches Peterson to make a documentary. And so her and her husband started filming to cover the naming ceremony. While they're filming for this, the whole Bill C-16 thing happened and Peterson exploded onto the world stage. So the focus of the documentary shifted from the naming ceremony to Peterson's rise. I feel like the change in the documentary's focus and narrative is noticeable, even though it wasn't brought up in the documentary itself. And so to explain what I mean here, let's compare it against another one, Icarus. Icarus was initially going to be about doping and cycling, but had a huge narrative shift partway through when the, arguably, more important issue popped up of the Russian doping scene and getting their source, Dr. Grigory Rodchenkov, safe. The shift from one story to the other wasn't hinted at in the beginning of the documentary, so when it happened, it took me a bit to figure out what was going on. And this off-centered feeling may have been intentional on the director's part. So both Icarus and The Rise of Jordan Peterson went through a narrative or focus shift partway through production. While Icarus was able to shift the narrative, in part by including part of the original content before the central point of the documentary, I don't think The Rise of Peterson was able to tell a solid story. Yes, we do see what went into The Rise of Peterson, but there isn't a strong, cohesive story there. Part of why I didn't get a sense of a strong central narrative is what seems like it would have been a chronological rise of Peterson wasn't fully chronological. Like there would be interview clips or news segments from definitely different periods of time. Related to this, sometimes establishing shots include on-screen text indicating where or when something is happening. Sometimes there is no date indicator. It can be somewhat inferred thanks to Peterson's shift in his aesthetic, but being able to nail down when things were happening would be helpful. Speaking of Peterson's aesthetic, it was interesting to see how it's changed as his reach has grown. We're shown some news clippings of Peterson as a teen, 
with the next step being the Peterson's wedding, then some recordings of Peterson teaching at Harvard in the 90s, followed by what I'm calling Peterson version 1. This look was very college professor at home. Relaxed and comfortable clothes, and a bit of what looks like a beer gut. Not trying to body shame here, just describing it as one of the ways to date the footage because it does change in V2. The next aesthetic, V2, was the Maverick Professor, exemplified by cowboy boots. This look includes suits that aren't particularly tightly tailored, cowboy boots, and a leaner Peterson than V1. I'm guessing this took place after his change to the lion diet, given the weight loss. This guess is reinforced by an interview he did with his daughter about said diet, but that'll be explained more in the summary. The final look in the documentary, V3, includes tailored suits with dress shoes and a beard. Of course, people are allowed to change their style. I haven't always had purple hair, after all. But the changes sort of coinciding with his rise made me curious about the choices behind those decisions. Alas, people don't tend to talk to Peterson about his sartorial choices. The last general thing I want to touch on here is how different Peterson sounds between V1 and V3. In the V1 era, he sounded more Kermity than he does in the V3. On a podium, he's about the same size as me in representation, but... No, but do you understand that for a woman watching this, and who is a victim of uh, sexual harassment in the workplace... I don't things care like that, about we, that. You don't care about what she may feel after she no, hears you? No, I don't care. I really don't care particularly what people feel about facts. Not sure what's up with that, but it was interesting to hear. The documentary opens with a kind of teaser montage. The first we see of Peterson from the documentary proper is from the summer of 2015. As I mentioned, I am super thankful for these time indicators because they're not always there. He's having a barbecue with his family. In a hopefully staged activity, Peterson's daughter Michaela gives him some form of personality test. One thing I want to highlight here is the interaction between Peterson and his wife Tammy. Keep my emotions under control. <laughs> <laughs> Three. Okay. No way, that's, that's Is that actually what you think, though? Really? You have no idea how irritated I actually am. <laughs> that doesn't, that's not the question. One, have apparently. You you? Yeah. These sorts of passive aggressive interactions make me cringe, not gonna lie. Next, we're shown Peterson V2-ish, teaching his Maps of Meaning course. He explains part of the purpose of that book. I've been studying authoritarianism for a very long time. It's been my life's work to inoculate people against ideological possession. It's the lesson that I try to teach people in my Maps of Meaning course. He also talks about political correctness, how he's been trying to keep an eye on it since the 90s. He says it died off for a while before coming back 2010-ish. Again, I'm having to put pieces together to estimate when he's talking about. His grad students would come to him, afraid to teach courses, because they were worried about saying something wrong and would face blowback. This caught my attention. He further specifies that they are worried about teaching things like gender or biology, and honestly, what were they teaching that they were so worried? I was able to successfully navigate this many times in intro psych, where by the very nature of the class, you have to do some pretty broad strokes and summaries to fully cover psychology. And yeah, it's possible to teach things like sex, orientation, all of that stuff without offending most people. Then we get to Canadian Bill C-16. He expresses concern that he'll face legal repercussions for what he says in class. What was he saying in his classes? I can almost understand not being able to talk about your research freely or whatever, but that isn't what this bill was about. I'll also add here that legal experts counter-argued that this isn't a risk with this bill, and certainly hasn't demonstrated to be one. All it did was add GSR and people to the list of protected classes. For a more thorough breakdown on this, I recommend Logic's video, which is linked in the description. Some audio of his original video on this bill is included, in which he says, I can envision a student or a colleague insisting that I call them using gender neutral pronouns. I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. I don't recognize another person's right to determine what pronouns I use to address them. I won't do it. Put a pin in this phrasing, because we're going to come back to it repeatedly. 
and it's originally from a video that is part of a three-part series that clocks in in about three hours total and skipping through trying to find the original context for this quote. If you ever find yourself with an extra three hours of time, it's something to watch. A fellow University of Toronto professor saw the video and was horrified, in part because they're trans and non-binary. So they started firing back on Twitter, as well as talking to administrators about what Peterson had said in his videos. Eventually, this led to a showdown of sorts on a news program. Why are you against the use of alternate pronouns? I'm, not, I'm against the use of, of le legislation to determine what words are that myself and other people are required to utter. Bill yeah. 6, C-16 is actually not about cisgender people. It's about protections for transgender people. Note how Peterson is shifting the narrative from refusing to use people's preferred pronouns and that he doesn't think gender is a spectrum and that gender can't be independent from biological sex and C-16 is compelling speech to he won't use people's preferred pronouns and C-16 is compelling speech. Also, a note from editing. In hunting down the news segment for the full discussion, it turns out this happened after the rallies that we'll talk about in a second. It wouldn't be a Peterson video if there wasn't some doom spiraling. He argues that he's drawing a line in the sand to say that things will go no further and that this didn't happen in Germany with the Nazis. That's some pretty catastrophic thinking behind not using a person's preferred pronouns. But this is going to be his hill to die on and the joke he makes about this situation later? Ugh. The next big thing is the trans teach-in and rally. Regarding this event, Peterson says that... So I'm going to have to make this very straightforward and simple. I don't disbelieve in the existence of non-binary people. Okay, do you want me to say that again? Obviously, people who don't fit into standard binary categories of sexual identity, uh, however you uh, decide to construe that, broadly or narrowly, obviously those people exist. Um, I never said they didn't exist. The focus is now on Peterson saying that he doesn't deny the existence of non-binary or trans people, but if you look back at that original video, one, you'll understand why they went with the recording him talking thing that they did, and also just what he said. I don't know what neither means, because I don't know what the options are if you're not a man or a woman. It's not obvious to me how you can be both because those are, by definition, binary categories. There's an idea that there's a gender spectrum, but I don't think that that's a valid idea. I don't think there's any evidence for it. Biological sexuality is ancient. It's hundreds of millions of years old. And it's binary because there's two forms of, of biological sex. Now, of course, this is predicated on the idea. A part not included in the documentary, but from this video, is that... I never said they didn't exist. What I said instead was that biological sex, gender identity, and gender expression do not vary independently. And they don't vary independently. And I'll just leave it at that for now because I don't have enough time to go into the rest of it, uh, although I will in the future, so. Without clarifying what he means further, but do note the echo from that original video. So put a pin on that other pin because this shift in focus is going to come up again. The teach and organizer explains the why behind the rally. It may have been the only gathering of that type in Canadian history of trans people in a public space gathering in a large number to go up to an open microphone and announce publicly their experiences. I don't think that's ever happened. And that was a huge deal to us when we put that on. The organizer further explains that they had requested film crews not film people without their consent, which everyone respected, except the people from Rebel Media. Surprise! If you aren't familiar, Rebel Media, now Rebel News, has been described on its Wikipedia page as Canada's Breitbart. Additionally, Lauren Southern was their reporter at the event. In the week before the event, she completed the paperwork to change her sex marker to male as a show of how easy it is to do in Ontario. So, the mood at the teach-in. Like, the people who were there were like raw that day, you know what I mean? Like, everyone who attended that rally was putting themselves in a very vulnerable position. And it was really just like being spat on. Peterson is shown talking to someone about group identity, which is something that will come up in the Let Children Skateboard rule. Spoilers! 
The doom spiral in the book is that having group identity leads to communism and gulags. But let's keep this mostly focused on the documentary. For some reason, an interview with the novelist behind Orphan X, Greg Hurwitz, is included at this point. Peterson mentions Hurwitz in 12 Rules as having helped shape some of the ideas in the Orphan X series. Hurwitz says he had Peterson while he was teaching at Harvard and talks about part of his teaching style. One of the things I remember is that if any student had an objection to something, if it was clear it was from an ideological angle, whether left or right, he would just sort of scissor it. Like if you're going to ask something disingenuously that part of what you're asking is to get information or make a power play in the phrasing of the question, that's not going to be tolerated in, in the kind of discourse of a classroom. This is coming from my experience as a student and a teacher, and also from a teaching certificate I picked up in grad school. Shutting down or scissoring student questions should be done in moderation. When I was teaching, I would sometimes receive questions that could have been perceived to be power plays or questioning my authority or whatever, and it's possible to answer these questions in a way that isn't top lobs or asserting dominance. Most of the time, the student would come up to me after class and apologize, like, hey, I'm sorry I worded that question poorly or it came out really strong. I wasn't trying to question your authority or your knowledge on this. Like, I'm so sorry. And, you know, it's fine. It's totally fine. No worries. I understood what you meant. There were a couple times where, yeah, it was a guy who was messing with me, but... Again, it's possible to answer and redirect those questions as I was modeled in undergrad. The most ideologically driven question I saw in my Bio 2 class as an undergrad. And there was a guy in the class who was vocally Christian, which, fine, you do you, boo. But we are in the evolution unit, and so the questions are becoming very frequent from this guy. And they weren't questions so much as young earth creationist propaganda being proposed as a question that's more of a statement. And the professor took probably like a day and a half of this before he reached his threshold, like he was done with this. But instead of scissoring the question or shutting it down, he said, look, I'm glad you're really engaged with this topic, but we're kind of holding up the class. If you'd like to continue this nature of questions, I'm more than happy to talk with you after class about this. And the guy stopped asking these young earth creationist questions. Weird. Bottom line here, I guess, is not everything has to be about dominance. But I digress. Part of a conversation between Hurwitz and Peterson v1 is shown, where Peterson indicates discomfort with getting political. The last thing I want to do, well, I don't know if it's the last thing, but I don't want to get into political arguments, and I don't want to get stuck in a, you know... Jumping back to where we were with the rallies, about a week after the teach-in, there was a rally for free speech. Peterson, V2, is shown interacting with some, I'm assuming, students who thank him for what he's doing. What you had to say uh, was definitely needed. I think. Good to hear it. I think there needs to be an open dialogue about this. God. Pausing here a moment to say that this is a recurring feature of this documentary, Peterson meeting with fans. And I'm honestly sort of of two minds about this. So on the one side, this is the rise of Jordan Peterson, and part of the rise is an increased fandom and people reading his work. So showing that he's meeting with people and it's having an impact makes sense. On the other, as a non-Peterson fan, seeing a meet with fan after 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 fan, and all of them saying, you know, oh my gosh, I'm so glad you're speaking about this. This is really needed. This is what the world needs. You changed my life, yada, yada, yada. It can feel a bit indulgent. And it also worries me a little bit that by showing all of these people agreeing with him, it's sort of setting up this case for arguing from popularity. All these people think what he's saying is a good thing. Therefore, it's a good thing. There's a little wrinkle in this though, where a possible shadow theme of this documentary is that Peterson is sort of losing himself to this fame. And this can be exemplified by how many fans he spends time with and not people like his wife. They also show Peterson interacting with Southern. It's mostly small talk, with Peterson asking her about her channel. It isn't clear from the documentary if this is the only outlet covering the event, or if Peterson spoke to other reporters besides Southern. 
So I'm not sure if this is meant to show Peterson kind of courting the alt-right, or just being friendly to a journalist. The attempts to prevent Peterson from talking are shown, with most of their effort going into introducing auditory feedback into the speakers. The organizer for this event puts forward the logic behind having this rally. People on the other side did not understand the people who are disagreeing with the social justice left. We feel that, yeah, there is an issue of political correctness. Well, it's not because I'm completely ignorant. It's because I'm trying to think about those things and trying to form an opinion about those things. He says that he's just trying to think about things, but then includes loaded language like the social justice left or the issue of political correctness. And this gets at a frustrating and complicated issue of the right balance between being exposed to challenging ideas and platforming either hurtful or hateful ideology. Further attempts to prevent Peterson from talking are shown, with Peterson eventually giving up on the microphone and yelling at the crowd. The reason I'm defending freedom of speech is because that's how people with different opinions settle their opinions in a civil society. Some have said this was just Peterson getting his voice loud enough to be heard, but for the space he's speaking in, you wouldn't have to yell. Projecting from the diaphragm can go a long way. Now, I understand being frustrated, even angry, about people trying to keep you from speaking. But speaking about civil societies while yelling is sending a bit of a mixed message. In this part, there is a taste of the prescient lobster daddy doom spirals to come. It's because that's how people with different opinions settle their opinions in a civil society. And if we lose that, if we lose that, we'll lose so much you can't imagine. He's almost certainly talking about the controlled speech leads to fascism slippery slope that comes up in 12 rules. But again, he's missing the point of this bill. It's to add a sometimes vulnerable minority group to the protected classes, not controlling speech. This hardly seems equivalent to the political leaders of a country blaming a minority group for the problems in that country. MAGA hat spotted in Canada. There's some heated interactions between attending students, then more of Peterson interacting with appreciative students. I just express my profound gratitude for what you're doing. Hey, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. And more student fans. And, change of pace, a student who questions Peterson on his language hill of death. How am I disrespecting it? By refusing to include this language, which is already in your vocabulary, into like a sentence just when addressing somebody, that's just a, a, an act of hate. Like that is ridiculous. Yeah, that's for sure. Like that to me is you're just you're denying somebody's identity, and that's fundamentally wrong. Well, you're more than entitled to your opinion. I think that the pathway that you're pursuing to obtain that the rights you want will will kick back hard and not in the direction you want it to. So. I, I really with another show of Peterson knowing what's best for everyone. At least here in the present, Peterson seems to have stopped doing therapy for the time being. Followed by another fan, the documentary's direct coverage of this event ends post-event by filming the interactions he had with his own students and I think his daughter. Portions of Rebel Media's footage is included, specifically one person who tried to interfere with their filming. Having the context from the teach-in organizer was definitely helpful in understanding the reaction they had. New segment and quote montage time for some breathing room. The chosen quotes are interesting. The first feels like it could be read a couple different ways, not all favorable to Peterson. The second got a snarky comment from Dr. Mr. The Husband when we watched it. A lot of people don't know enough professors to know that that doesn't mean anything. The teach-in organizer is given a little more time. You have no idea if I'm your enemy. You have no idea about me. You won't use my pronouns, so I'm pretty sure you're my enemy, yes. Yeah, well, I know you think that, but I don't believe that using your pronouns is going to do you any good in the long run. I think it'll do quite the contrary. What the fuck? Is what? that your medical Wait, opinion? Why? Is that your medical opinion? Like, you I'm are aware that non-binary people are valid in the, on, in the American Psychological Association. Is that your opinion? Yes, it is. No, it's not. It's about non-binary pronouns. No, it's not. And again, Peterson is shifting focus away from his initial refusal to use people's preferred pronouns, plus the other erasing claims. While we're here, take note of this person standing behind Peterson, because they'll come up again. Pausing again. Woven into what Peterson said here is his apparent belief that he's doing the right thing for people by not using their pronouns. That he really knows what's best for them. 
I've come to wonder if part of his emphasis on the fundamental category being between male and female in Rule 2, treat yourself like someone you're responsible for helping, is from this belief. Like he sees the statistics about the higher suicide rate among the trans population and instead of asking members of that group what's going on, he assumes that the negative things that they're experiencing is purely a consequence of them not going with their assigned sex at birth. There. See? I tried to take your perspective, Peterson, just like you said to do in Rule 9, and I remain unconvinced. Back to the documentary. The teach and organizer shares a clip of one of the other speakers at the free speech rally. They go on to talk about Peterson's popularity surge being tied in with the Trump campaign and election. Briefly, they hoped it would all be a blip and things would go back to normal, but as we all know, that didn't happen. They note the prevalence of Trump merch at the event and observe that this has become an ongoing political identity. I wonder what Peterson would make of his position being called that seeing as how he is staunchly against identity politics. To round out the documentary's breathing space, Peterson reads part of a letter he wrote to his dad when he was an undergrad or early in his PhD process. It's in regards to his obsession on what led to the Cold War. He includes an idea from Jung that societal problems could be fixed by solving personal problems. Peterson also says that if he started trying to fix this and failed, it would destroy him on some level. It's unclear if he's talking to a personality class or his Maps of Meaning class, but Peterson, V2, says that he brings history into his personality class because the society has an impact on the people and the likelihood for engaging in atrocities. This idea is expanded on in a Rogan interview, where he explains his emphasis to students in the Maps of Meaning course that but Had they been in Nazi Germany in the 1930s, they would have been Nazis. And had they been op offered the opportunity to be an Auschwitz, Auschwitz camp guard, then maybe they would have leapt at it. And maybe they would have been in the sadistic, uh, in sadistic proportion of the Auschwitz camp guard population. You think that makes you feel safe? It doesn't make you feel safe to know that Nazis were humans and you happen to be one of them. I understand the importance of emphasizing that people who followed the Nazi ideology were still people. They weren't unknowable monsters, they were human. And it's important to not lose sight of that so we can try to not follow similar paths ourselves. But to categorically say that everyone in Germany at that time was a Nazi is untrue. I've shared this on this channel before, but my mother's father, so my grandfather, was sent to the US from Germany by his mother right as the Nazis were coming into their power. He was a freshly trained machinist and my great-grandmother didn't want to see him swept up into whatever was coming and it cost them everything to send him here. And in fact-checking that with my mom, apparently our family motto could be, Hitler never had the majority. Like, it was a huge issue for my extended family, especially in Germany. It's like someone saying in 50 years that everyone in America was a Trump supporter. Some people are sure, but he doesn't have the majority. Peterson, V1, talks about his extensive painting collection. People ask me, you know, sometimes people are shocked when they come into the house because I've got paintings of Lenin. It's not like I don't know he was an absolutely murderous tyrant, but... But I want to understand it. The documentary follows Peterson, V2, to McMaster where he's been invited to give a talk. This talk is almost cancelled because of security concerns. It's unclear if it was not cancelled because of Peterson speaking to the people trying to stop it, or for other reasons, but they film him talking to the organizer about who he needs to lean on. There's also an interesting exchange between Peterson and his wife Tammy. Scum rats. So the risk management office is thinking about pulling their permission. Yeah. And if they go ahead with it, then they, they cancel them as a club for the next year. You're kidding! Nope. That's threatening, that's a... Uh... That's called blackmail. Blackmail, that's it, yeah. Mm, that made me mad. Yeah, I see that. Yeah. Oh, 
shaking again. Oh well. Initially, I wasn't going to include this, but my script editor encouraged me to do so as it does show the sort of weird dynamic between the two of them. Like, I can't imagine Tammy didn't hear how angry he was on the phone, but he had to tell her that he was angry. What? The speaking event is set to go, but there are a fair number of protesters trying to stop it. At one point, there's a look from Peterson I want to touch on. In my first video in the 12 Rules series, I talked about the disruption of Peterson's classes and wasn't on board with deplatforming someone in this way and caught some flack for it. But this look from Peterson is part of why I have this stance I do. I don't want to play into the narrative that the left are a bunch of triggered snowflakes who can't stand to hear a differing opinion. But I also get that some of the things that Peterson says, a lot of things, can be very hurtful. Going out of his way not to just do a simple social kindness and use somebody's pronouns is fucked up. I'm personally of the mindset that there's a couple approaches to take. One is when presented with something substantial like 12 Rules or whatever Shapiro's book is, go into the arguments being made, look at what evidence they have to support their claims, and use actual facts and logic to analyze their arguments. Or, in online spaces, maybe trying internet comment etiquette's approach to misinformation. Hosting pictures of undressed old guys. I guess you could call it an absurdist response? But these are my opinions and everybody has their own, so take it for what it's worth and let's get back to the documentary. The rise of Peterson continues with him, V2, talking about the letters he receives from fans thanking him for what he does. And here's the uh, joke I mentioned earlier. Well, financially, nope. it's been a boom, right? I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to because it's just so goddamn funny. I can't help but say it. <laughs> I figured out how to monetize social justice warriors. <laughs> uh, Peterson's relatively social media shy son makes an appearance. Plus a shot of Michaela with her hair dyed super red, which is what keyed me into her being the person post-rally earlier in the film. I wonder if, at least one, Peterson fan is aware that she wasn't always blonde. <laughs> Tammy credits Michaela for helping Peterson fix his depression. Yep, this documentary includes an origin story for the lion diet. We're shown the wrap-up to his Maps of Meaning class, with him saying the way to prevent things like the Cold War from happening again was... It seemed to me that the proper solution to that was to live properly. And this is the Peterson conundrum. The top, distilled message tends to be all right. It's when you go digging into the details that the problems emerge. Some more Peterson rising. And then we hit the part that sent the fan response bits over the edge for me. A group of 15 year olds talking about the profound impact 12 Rules has had on their lives. Up until I had seen him, I was sort of drifting around, I would say. I, I was spending a lot of time just doing things that are inconsequential and a bit unproductive. After following him and really learning about, about how to act in the world is how, what I would say he taught me to do. And I just became a lot more aware of all the things that I need to change. Okay, I'm glad these kids got something useful out of 12 rules, but they're kids. Hopefully this isn't a controversial opinion, but Kids should be having fun. Yes, they should be learning about the world and their eventual place in it, but it shouldn't stamp out the careless fun that you can't really replicate as an adult. The following meet and greet segment does show someone in their 30s who has gotten a positive message out of 12 rules. Good for him. But hearing teens talk about how much this work has turned their life around seems a bit hyperbolic. I just want to acknowledge that it is possible that these kids were toying around with ideologies that tend to end in things like pill. But from the way they interact with each other and just the general way they come across, it seems more likely that they were spending too much time playing things like video games or D&D or something that just wasn't as productive as Peterson would have liked for them. Oh, yeah, there's also this choice moment. You have given me the courage to stand up for my conservative and libertarian beliefs in the classroom. How's that working out? Oh, oh the history teacher's mad. Yeah? But, uh, <laughs> we've, got, we've, got, um, we've got a few kids in our class keeping the neo-Marxist history teacher in check. Neo-Marxist high school teachers? Really? Really? Seriously? In another interview, Peterson V3, talks about how touched he is by the positive impact he's had on people's lives. 
And I'm again going to pause to address the type of comment I get on the 12 rules videos. Basically, why am I trying to tear down something that has been helpful for people? My answer is that while I'm glad that Peterson is able to reach people, particularly guys, when they're in this dark place and their life could go a couple different ways, some more darker than others, he's able to give them a more positive way to live their life. Cool. But what I would like to see is them eventually get the skills to critically analyze what they're consuming both videos like mine or Peterson. And I also worry about the Peterson conundrum. The surface level message for a lot of these rules is fine, sometimes even good. But when you start to dig into the details and the support behind those rules, the evidence goes from questionable to problematic. Basically what I'm saying is that it's okay to grow past something that helped you at some point. Conveniently, an example is included of one of Peterson's rules. This is about the clean your room idea. Peterson talks about someone with a hoarding problem and that being reflective of their inner mental state. He then says to fix their mental state, they should clean their room. Sure, the hoarding behavior should be reined in, but if that's all you do, the person is probably going to go back to hoarding. It's a psychological disorder that tends to co-occur with other disorders like OCD or depression. A simple clean your room isn't going to address those other underlying disorders. The advice is trying to treat the symptom, not the problem. We're shown Peterson V2, going through the fan mail he receives on a regular basis before the appearance of someone I'm glad they included. Bernard Schiff was instrumental in helping Peterson get the University of Toronto position. He advocated for Peterson because of the unique way that Peterson approached things, but with the shift around Bill C-16 and the following events, he changed his opinion. I'll include a link in the description to an interview Schiff did where he talked about this at length, but just be forewarned that the link can sometimes be a bit moody. Schiff wrote a piece for the Toronto Star about his opinion on Peterson's ideology. What was extremely upsetting to me was the disregard for students, and he was extremely polarizing at a time that more polarization was not helpful. We're then shown Peterson's response to this story. Well, it caused grief, I would say, is the right way of thinking about it. I regard Bernie as a friend, and he had been a very good, well, good friend to me in all sorts of ways and to my family. So it came out of the blue. That was the other thing. It was a real surprise. And I was surprised that we hadn't discussed any of this. Schiff says he called Peterson to give him a heads up about the story that was coming. Peterson said he knew this was a sensitive issue for Schiff, as Schiff has a trans daughter. But Schiff said that wasn't behind his choice to publish his story before trying to reiterate what he had written, only to be interrupted by Peterson. He says, Bernie, you don't understand. I'm willing to give up everything because I really believe this. I'm willing to give up my job. I'm willing to give up, I don't remember what else he put on the line, because I believe it. And, and then he says, and Bernie, Tammy, that's his wife, had a dream. He said, okay, what was the dream? And sometimes your dreams are prophetic. Her dreams are prophetic. I mean, coming from somebody who is an ardent follower of you, that's not entirely surprising, but sometimes the more you know about someone, the less seriously you can take their arguments, you know? I try to take counseling psychology seriously because there is a lot of good research happening and good practices happening out in the field, but then there's stuff like this and just, what are you doing, guys? What was the dream? She dreamed it was five minutes to midnight. The end of the world. And Jordan is there to save us from that. And I know Jordan pretty well by now, and I'm saying, okay, Jordan, there's really nothing to talk about. And I hung up. Schiff then indicates that Peterson has tried to talk to him since that conversation, but he feels that there's nothing to be gained in talking given Peterson's trajectory. Sort of like Peterson, Schiff has received letters and emails from people appreciative of him essentially standing up against Peterson. Peterson doesn't disagree that he's a polarizing figure, and interestingly says he's opposed to the collectivist notions on the left and right. So he still sees himself as a centrist who's helping. I think it's part and parcel of the fact that we're in polarized times and I've done what I can when I thought it was necessary to pull that polarization back. I'm going to really test Amazon's tolerance and reviews. 
By the way, I have a Patreon, so you know, it's really nice. But I feel this quote is important. What I worry about is the feature-like quality of his. He's been interested in the authoritarian personality. He's been fascinated by the uh, horrible people in history. His house is filled with Stalinist art. Uh, he says to remind him about the awful things of that culture. And he has a number of YouTubes in which he describes how they operate. And it was he was doing exactly the same thing. To build on this idea, a portion of the Maps of Meaning class is shown with Peterson, B2, saying how he tried to understand Hitler's mindset, saying the crowd was complicit in what happened. We transition to a Q&A on Peterson's YouTube channel. Franklin says fans are cancer for the authentic individual. Peterson interprets this as a question about fame and the fan following he's accumulating. Interestingly, he says, I can't imagine what it would be like to be hated publicly. I think that would just kill me. I really think that. I wonder if he still holds that opinion, or if he's learned to discount the haters. Interview montage, including, of course, the shit show on the BBC. V3, Peterson, says that he was surprised that because he was only really going after the left's agenda, that he'd be called a Nazi. Followed by a shot of the free speech rally with Lauren Southern friendly wandering into frame. We cut back to a live stream where Peterson, B2, takes a couple attempts to give his position on the alt-right. And then, and then one, one last thing. thing. I'm, I'm not, not exactly sure, sure how to understand what the alt-right alt -right characterize it, or even to th think, know what to think about its hypothetical existence or my association with it. But I can tell you that I'm not in favor of people banding together in ideological groups and instead would much rather see People live fundamentally productive and meaningful and honest individual lives and in that manner be a light unto their neighbors, so to speak. An artist friend of Peterson's speaks about their friendship. Jordan, Jordan is playing this kind of in-between character and he's, he, he's kind of standing in between different sides. Because the left has been winning the culture war, let's say, for the past decades, because of that, the fact that Jordan is standing there more, I think he's standing quite in the middle and he's trying to call the attention to the fact that the left is becoming totalitarian. I loathe this idea of the culture war with the right painting themselves as trying to keep the world from descending into barbaric chaos. That barbaric chaos, including things like access to abortion, truly equal rights for everyone, not favoring Judeo-Christian values when deciding how the country should be run, you know. He agrees that Peterson is the guy in the middle trying to establish balance. In interacting with physicists, as well as Discordians, from all over the world, like China, Russia, parts of Europe, Africa, you get a different perspective on what the left and right can be. This difference between North America's left and right and Europe's, specifically the UK, was perfectly exemplified by the BBC exchange between UK right-wing Andrew Neil and US alt-right Ben Shapiro. Why don't you just say that you're on the left? Uh, is this so hard for you? Why can't you just be honest? <laughs> Mr. Shapiro, Seriously, I, it's a serious question. Mr. Shapiro, if you only knew how ridiculous that statement is, you wouldn't have said it. So let's move on. Peterson, V2, describes receiving mail from self-described neo-Nazis who he says disagree with him. His artist friend goes on to say, This is hard for people on the left to really understand is that he has actually been tempering the right. And I think he knows that he's been doing that because we've all felt that there is this really radical right that's bubbling underneath and it's there. There's no doubt about it that it's there. But the problem is what do you do with those people? How do you interact with them? Like if you just say, oh, they're evil, like let's not talk to them. We just need to shut them out. They're just, it's just gonna keep growing. And that is an important problem for conservatives. What do you do about the alt-right? Especially the more extreme end of the alt-right. This issue of de-radicalizing people from extreme beliefs is something that is becoming an important issue, and I'm not sure that there's a clear answer yet. His friend thinks that basically going back to the conservative life goals, wife, kids, job, is the answer. In a slice of life moment, we get to see what breakfast looks like in the Peterson household. It strikes me as a little sad that he doesn't really engage with his wife until she answers his question. You haven't been like, getting up and doing yoga with me? Oh, tight. Tight muscle. You'll have to start I getting up and doing yoga with oh. me again. So what muscle is that? 
runs down my back. It's probably levator scapula because when you look at the screen, yeah. you always put your chin forward, which oh, yeah. makes it spasm. A little context here. Tammy was a massage therapist before stopping to focus on their family. Now, I am, at this point, a trailing spouse. It was our way of handling the academic two-body problem. I understand that this can be a support role for some people on the trailing end of things, and that's fine. But boundaries on what is and isn't okay for the lead in the relationship are important, and at least in what's shown here, it seems like Peterson's prioritizing work over Tammy. But the main source of my sadness for her will come in a little bit. We're then taken to Alberta to visit with Peterson's parents. Peterson, B2, describes not being super happy about being tied up into the political stuff, but that it was an unavoidable side effect of speaking out against C-16. He was apparently involved with the New Democratic Party as a teen, but got burned by them. The party operatives, I didn't like them when I was 16. They were, I could tell already that most of them were driven by resentment. And, it was, and that's when I read George Orwell. And, you know, he said, well, the middle-class socialist types generally don't like the poor, they just hate the rich. And I thought, oh yeah, that's it. That's it. He put his finger right on that problem. This idea from Orwell is at the heart of at least part of the 12 rules and Peterson's opposition to the left. He does have a tendency to paint the left as selfishly motivated to tear down those above them in the hierarchy without regard to those below. But it's possible for a person to want to smash the bourgeoisie and also improve the lives of those in the lower SES tiers. It's not mutually exclusive. There's a strange segment where Peterson talks about his very first political memory being Robert Kennedy's funeral, and his unshakable feeling that he'd have a funeral of similar magnitude. The last person we're introduced to is another friend and fellow psych professor at U of T. This friend says that there's basically two, well, three Jordans. There's the Jordan Peterson I know, there's the Jordan Peterson I see on Twitter, and then there's the cult of Jordan Peterson, which also has its own ideas, which are sometimes only somewhat correlated with what he actually believes. They take a walk to catch up since Peterson has been so busy, but are interrupted by another fan. His friend says he isn't oblivious to what Peterson has said. I mean, I get upset when I read some of the horrible things he says, and he does say horrible things sometimes. Which leads to a montage of tweets and interviews. During this, his friend says that Peterson doesn't see that he's doing the same thing he accuses them of doing, and actually shuts down chances of dialogue between opposing sides. One interview that's included is with Vice, where Peterson made the assertion that women wearing heels and makeup in the workplace are actually doing sexual displays. Does anyone want to break it to Peterson that heels started off as a military, specifically cavalry thing, to make staying in stirrups easier? The professor friend continues on to say that the Peterson that the world knows isn't lining up with the Peterson he knows. Like, he doesn't believe anything the way that it was framed there. This raises the question, what's going on here? Why does his friend have a completely different perception of Peterson from what the public does? even though he can see the tweets and the interviews. Hmm. The last, main portion of the documentary focuses on Tammy and her relationship with Peterson. She describes their early relationship. And that had to be about the third time he asked me to marry him, and I finally said yes. So he said, okay, if that's going to be the case, if we're going to get married, then the guiding principle in our relationship has to be truth. Or it won't work. I am honestly skeeved out by him repeatedly asking her to marry him, followed by him demanding that this was going to be the nature of their relationship. But she ultimately went with it. Tammy talks about early in their marriage, and how there was a lot of old, multi-generational behaviors and beliefs that had to be worked on. Her example is being anxious about having people over for dinner. Jordan would, you know, oh, that'd be a question for him. Why was I having trouble with this? And then he wouldn't let it go. He wouldn't let it go. We'd have to get to the bottom of it. We'd have to figure it out because we didn't want to have this argument again. I'm a bit disturbed that this went from her being anxious about something to Peterson pushing they figure out the central issue behind that anxiety and they had to do it now to not have this argument again in the future. The sometimes several day trip from her anxiety to a fight doesn't sound like a healthy relationship dynamic. But she says this process helped them solidify their relationship. 
I'm curious if this process worked both ways and Tammy could provide feedback on Peterson's behavior or if it was just Peterson essentially training his wife. Also, remember the previous interactions I showed between the two of them. Having this extra context could explain the oddity and sadness I felt during those. Kind of going back to the trailing spouse idea, Tammy describes being with Peterson every step of his journey, but... And so finding moments where where we have him again are, are precious moments. It, it wasn't scary, and it hasn't been overwhelming, but I've lost Jordan to the world. Then we're left with final comments. Peterson says that people's lives matter and that their ethical decisions impact the world. The teach-in organizer would have preferred the documentary be centered on the trans and non-binary community and what experiences and consequences they faced because of this controversy around C-16. And they're worried that focusing on Peterson here builds up his influence even further. The final word goes to Peterson, with him saying that he's trying to tell the best story and that if his fails, the alternative story will lead to catastrophic outcomes. Well, sort of last word. We end on a truly something moment. So something. I had forgotten this was part of it. So this is what I actually look like and then this is what people who don't like me think I look like. And, uh, and before Peterson walks out to an adoring crowd, before going back to the mask. Thing is real. Yeah, that's a good question. Well, I would say they're both real. And back to the crowd. Roll credits. So that was my response and summary of the documentary covering Peterson's rise to where he is now-ish. And as I said at the outset, it was more balanced than I was expecting going into it. Although, as I have indicated as a non-Peterson fan, it could be a bit much in places. Related to this, the thought occurred to me that a possible explanation for the inconsistent dating that happened is an assumption that it would be mostly Peterson fans watching this documentary, and an assumption that those Peterson fans would have a rough idea of when these different things happen, so they'd be able to sort of follow the jumps through time better. But as someone who's focused on 12 rules and didn't really track the rise of Peterson when it was happening, this kind of feels just like a homogenous mass of stuff happening. That's why I latched onto his clothing as a form of temporal clue for when stuff was happening. This documentary did give insight into the man behind the work, and in some cases may have shed some light on the reason why he's doing certain things or believe certain things. Believing that your wife has prophetic dreams and she's seeing the end of the world unless you do your stuff would certainly light a fire under your ass. But believing that your wife has prophetic dreams? What can I say? Uh, doesn't sound rational? Would be a good summary. Overall, I'm not sure I would generally recommend this documentary. If you're interested in learning a bit more about Peterson and what makes him tick, plus the factors and breakdown of what led to his rise, check it out. If that doesn't describe you, spend your time watching other things. Like my videos. Yes, that is a shameless plug. Always gotta be on the hustle. One final thought to leave you with. I think he doesn't see that when he's fighting this battle, he's actually falling victim to the exact same things that he's accusing them of. What I worry about is the preacher-like quality of his. He's been interested in the authoritarian personality. He's been fascinated by the uh, horrible people in history. His house is filled with Stalinist art. Uh, he says to remind him about the awful things of that culture. And he has a number of YouTubes in which he describes how they operate. And it was, he was doing exactly the same thing. I spent a lot of time thinking about Hitler, and I was thinking, well, how do you get into a state like that, you know? And you think, well, he's a dictator, and he led his people down a bad path. It's like, that's not right. That is not what happened. They had a conspiracy together and went down a bad path. Now, think about it this way. The crowd's not happy, and neither are you, and there's reason for it. And so you start talking to them. You don't know what you're upset about. And neither does the crowd. So you start to articulate some things about why you might be upset. And some of them fall flat, but you're paying attention to the crowd. And some of the things make the crowd really wake up and listen. 
And so you start saying more of those things. But it's not like you're sitting there saying, although you might be, I'm going to tell this crowd more what it wants to hear. It's more sophisticated than that. And so you do that a thousand times, and you do that to ever-increasing crowds. And the crowd really starts to go mad. And they basically tell you that you're the savior of the nation. It's like, at what? how many bloody people have to tell you that before you start to believe it? If you enjoyed this, hit me up with a like. You can also join the discourse by commenting below. And you can also subscribe. That's always a fun option. You can also find me on Twitter, my Discord server, or on Patreon. Patreon's really fun. You should do that one if you have the money. Uh, links for everything are in the description box below. And that's it for this video. See you guys next week for more Peterson fun. Bye!